Look at that title again. A pure Christ demands my pure love. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves you? That's weak. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves you? Yes. Could you imagine receiving a love letter from Jesus? Well, some people call the entire Bible a love letter, and I'm okay with that. But my question today is this. What does Jesus see today when he looks upon his church? What does he see? And more specifically, what does Jesus see when he looks upon this community fellowship named Calvary Assembly of God in Pensacola, New Jersey? What does Jesus see? I believe these are very important questions that need to be looked at honestly and very carefully in order for us to know the truth and the full counsel of God, what it means for us to serve Jesus and what he demands from us in the way of our love. Now, I was really debating this, but I found an old letter from my wife years and years ago, and I want to share it with you. It's a bit personal, but I'm going to go there. She wrote, Dear Danny, that's me, Danny. (laughs) She said, I get to see you every day, and I do notice all the things you do. I notice that you are a hard worker, and you patiently endure all the hardships in life. You do not tolerate evil in any form, and you protect your family from any wrong doctrine and preach the truth. You don't give up as you remain faithful to provide for me and our family in every way. But I do have this complaint against you. You don't love me or the kids as you did when we first were married and when I had your children. Do you realize how far away you are from me? Come back to the place you were when we first met. If you don't change, I will remove my wedding ring from my finger. (laughs) April Fools, that's not a real letter. (laughs) But let's go to a real letter. Look with me, Revelation chapter 2. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Now that's a good spot for either an ouch or a wow or an amen because it's the truth of God's word. But think about how we are as human beings when we try to evaluate a church, and the ministry of the church of Jesus Christ. Think about how we look at things and we see things that tend to be somewhat superficial because we don't look deeply into the truth 
of what that church is doing or who that church really is. Truth is, there are many elaborate churches and structure and facilities that are filled with spiritually dead people. And yet there are very modest, humble church facilities and buildings that have people in them that are spiritually alive and filled with the fire of God. Over in Revelation 3, verse 17, it says, You say, I am rich, I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize, you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So just showing that we don't even have the capability sometimes to see things as they really are and not as we would want them to be. Hmm. And then in chapter 2, verse 9, if you want to just scan down to that, he says, I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. I can see your constant improvement in all these things. But, (laughs) but, you see, We have this tendency to look at the outward, don't we? The outward appearance of different churches and people. And the churches sometimes that we think are rich, Jesus would label as poor. And those other churches that we would label as poor, Jesus would label those churches as rich. Now, my question to us is this. Who knows the truth about any church in its real condition? Who knows the truth? Who knows the truth? God, Jesus does. He is the head of the church. It's his business to know what's going on in the church. Jesus sees the inside of the church and not just the outside. Chapter 2, verse 23, in the second part says, And I will give to you, I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. Wow. In other words, Jesus knows how to take spiritual x rays, He knows how to see the truth of who and what the church really is and the true condition of that church. You know, when I read this, I realize how easy it is to forget that not only is Jesus speaking to the church, the corporate body, but he's speaking to the church as individuals. We forget that churches are made up of individuals. We forget that. We tend to label Calvary Assembly of God in Pensacan, right? But all that is truly indicating is the corporate body. But we forget that you don't have a corporate body unless you have individuals who are following Jesus Christ. And as you collectively put them together, right? You have a community, church. Now, if it's true, and it is true, that statement, I want you to consider this. Put your seatbelts on. Everybody sitting here today is determining the spiritual life of what we know as Calvary Assembly of God. You can't get away from it. Everyone that sits here determines the true spiritual life or the true condition of the corporate body. Let that sink into your mind and to your heart. Paul was concerned about the very same thing that we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. 
as he wrote, but I fear that somehow your pure, notice, pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be what? Corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. Paul is appealing to the corporate body, understanding that individuals within that body were off track, off road, the road of where we need to be to represent the true and living Christ. So, that statement that I had up prior, I want to just break it down a little bit more because I believe it's true. All of us today are making choices. All of us are making choices that are affecting everyone else within this community of believers. We don't want to hear that. We don't, want to, we don't want to take ownership of that truth. That every choice I make affects you. And every choice that you make affects me. Just let, let's do this. Come on, just do that. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to face that reality because God knows me. God knows my situation. God knows how hard I have and no one understands. And on and on and on we go excusing ourselves and trying to separate ourselves from the reality that we as indiv individuals affect the entire body. What does the Bible say, right? A little leaven, right? A little leaven affects the whole loaf of bread. Just need a little yeast. How many ever made bread before? Right? You don't put in cakes and cakes and cakes. Just a little yeast makes that dough become a loaf of bread. How true it is. And I say, God... One of the curses we have, we're blessed as Americans in the sense of freedom. We don't, <laughs> things are not going too well though there. But we're cursed with that whole idea of fighting individualism within the church. We think that it's all about me. And how many times have you heard it from me and others in this church to say it's not about you? It's not about me. It's about Jesus. <laughs> it's about Jesus and what he demands. And we need to give our attention to that truth. We're fighting against American culture, church, that is against the biblical church. Make no mistake about it. It's not good. It's not good. It's not good. The things that we carried on from week to week, month to month, year to year, generation to generation, saying this is church, when maybe, just maybe, it's not church the way Jesus said church should be. A church that has lost its passion. Oh, we're doing so much. Look, Pastor, you just said you commended us. We're giving to missions. We're preaching the truth. We have ministries, and on and on and on and on it goes. Great music, great teaching, great preaching. But we lost the passion for Jesus Christ. I see that in the life of Saul. And I had the privilege, Evelyn and I, to celebrate her birthday this past week to take her to see the new uh, play of the, in the, of the life of David in Lancaster, and I recommend it highly. But it brought it to light. He thought he had it all together, and then his, his life just falls apart. And what happens when his life falls apart? 
It affected the entire nation. 1 Samuel 28 says, He asked the Lord what he should, what he should do. And instead of really humbling himself, because he did ask God at first, but then he, he turned everything around and he went to a fortune teller, a medium to try to find out what he should do. And then in chapter 31, verse 4, it says, Saul groaned to his armor bearer. He said, take your sword and kill me. But the armor bearer said, no way, I'm not going to do that. So Saul took his own sword and he fell on it. And the Bible tells us that Saul's downfall was not sudden. It was gradual. He didn't see it coming. There are so many pastors today who are preaching the truth of God's word. And very often we have to come to a place where we have to tell people, watch out, be careful, pay attention to your life. And people, Christian people, they're so wonderful. <laughs> Who does he think he is telling me about money? Who does he think he is? <laughs> very often people in church have pastors for lunch but there's no food involved. Mm. And pastors are just trying to sound the warning alarm. You cannot play with fire without getting burned. And what's the response? Who, me? No, not me. What fire? What danger? I'm okay. Nothing has changed in my life. Mm. Now, you know the old saying, right? Anytime you go like this, there's three pointing back. And this could be never even more true than the fact that this applies to pastors. True for leaders. A good leader, a good pastor doesn't go bad overnight. It doesn't happen. No one becomes overweight overnight, right? Amen. Last night, oh, I ate the whole pint of Ben and Jerry's. Look at me now. No, it does happen gradually. Isn't that true? Well, just in case you need to understand that, I want you to look at the screen. A frog is a cold-blooded animal, and humans are warm-blooded, so our body burns energy or perspires to maintain the same 98.6 degrees. The cold-blooded frog's body temperature goes up and down with the temperature of its surroundings. Although frogs love water, when I hold it over this pot of boiling water, this frog is very uncomfortable and climbs to get away from it. Now the water in this pot is room temperature, 69.4 degrees, so he's comfortable when I put him in. If I turn the burner on low flame, his body temperature will adjust and slowly he will heat up with the water. The water temperature has risen to 80 degrees and the frog is the same temperature and still comfortable. If I turn up the burner slowly again, he won't notice because he'll continue to change to be the same as his surroundings. When we started, I held the frog over the first pot of boiling water. He was uncomfortable and he tried to get away from the heat. But now, because we're raising the temperature slowly, he doesn't recognize the danger he's in. He just keeps going along with the change in his surroundings. Actually, we can turn up the burner to a deadly boil
Do we get it? Yes. Or do we get it? That's the point. Do we get it? Or do we really get it? Little by little. Little by little. Consumed. Consumed by the world. Consumed by American culture. Consumed by our own selfish, sometimes very lustful desires. Consumed by our own laziness. Consumed about a lack of priorities in our lives. But we're so captivated by saying, oh, look at him. Look at her. Look at the church. Wow, I like this church. They have ministries. They've got this. They've got music. They've got great preaching. On and on and on we go. Not realizing that gradually, 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 we're off track, way off track. And according to Scripture, I believe saying where there's no return. We need to understand, before Jesus ever judges the world, he must judge his own people. That's Scripture. That's Scripture. And if you don't believe, read with me 1 Peter chapter 4. It's on the screen. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? It's going to begin with us. And what a terrible fate for those who are not responding to the good news of Jesus Christ. Remember, the church at Ephesus was steadfast, sacrificing, doing their things, their weekly activities, enduring the tests and the trials of life. They were separated from false doctrine and ministers. They knew about suffering, but, but, Jesus said, look how far you have fallen. You don't love me, and you don't love others. That's the little extra we forget in that portion of Scripture. You don't love others the way you did at first. And it's so easy for us as churches to get proud of what we have. And the thing that, whew, the thing that annoys me, I guess just because of my calling and being a pastor, is when I see some churches that very evidently and obviously worship their pastors, and it's unacceptable. They're talking about their pastor this way. Look, don't get me wrong. Appreciation is good, and it's needed and necessary, and that's scriptural as well. But to worship, to cross that line and make it all about the pastor or pastors or staff or, again, what we have is unacceptable. Jesus said, hey, 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 kids, hey, church, you no longer love me with the same intensity. What happened? And I believe the answer is pretty easy although it's not, they became professional Christians. And I think we have a lot of churches today that are filled with professional Christians doing many of the right things at the right time, yet the fire has died out. And it's happened so gradually that we don't even realize it. The passion, the passion. That's why I use that joking letter to say, oh, my wife, is she's saying all these nice things, but, honey, you lost your passion. It's just not the same anymore. This is not only scary, but it's so potentially deadly because of that fact that it's, hardly noticeable until the crisis comes. 
And then we go, Jesus, help me. No power in the life of the church. How many times have you heard this pastor say, we don't know what tomorrow may bring. Is it going to be then that we go, oh, or should we be praying now? Should we be at prayer meeting now? Should we be at discipleship now? Should be, we be in fellowship now? More than ever, involved in each other's lives and just giving and praying and sharing together just like the Scripture says because that shows passion for Christ. Because whose church is it? Jesus' Jesus's church. Not pastor or any denomination. It's Jesus' church. And I look at the story of Samson. Look on the screen, Judges 16, 20. Then she cried out, who's she? Delilah, remember that? Delilah? Delilah? Her name means languishing. I was just talking to Mark Gardner about this last week. He was sharing that with me. It stuck with me. She cried out, Samson, you know the story, right? She cut his hair off. Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. And when he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. We'll do as we always do. But wait a minute. Things are different now. The power of God's not with us. And we don't understand, again, this whole thing about Old Testament, New Testament. God's messages are timeless when it comes to his people. God's messages are timeless. They cross over any time span or even certain conditions of culture and so it doesn't matter his message his word is truth always and I think about it and I say wait a minute if that's true and it is then submission to God's word is my greatest strength submission to God's word is my greatest strength and not going to go there because you've heard it so many times If we don't give ourselves to God's word, we are going to be at best weak and at worst saying, God, and not realizing it's it's different now. Disobedience just brings judgment and separation. That's all it does. When we disobey what God says should be priority to our lives, loving him, loving his word, loving his presence, It's my submission to God today that keeps me strong and keeps me protected no matter what comes my way because God is my only hope to make it through any trial or anything that I would have to face in these last days. How many have ever had a dripping, leaking faucet in your house? How many women would say, How many times I told my husband, honey, it's a dripping faucet. (laughs) Fix it. And every night you go to bed and you hear it click, drip, 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 drip. And little by little, I see it the same way for so many. Being in in the pastoral field for over 40-something years, 45 years, see people simply easily falling away from God. And don't, don't just think it's those people that are superficial, but those, some of those people were so passionate about God, so in love with Jesus. They were the people that were always in church and always at prayer meetings, faithful to serve. And some of them even had a, a, a very clear, obvious anointing of God upon their lives, blessed by God. But gradually, things change. Angelica shared that with me. Some of the people she was out ministering with, passionate with God, falling away, and they don't want anything to do with God. 
I've seen it in church. I've seen it in church. It has happened, and it can happen to anyone. So I think it would be a great thing to close this up by asking ourselves, how can we prevent this from happening to us? Well, let me tell you, I, I very clearly know what I need to do, and I share it with you based on scriptural counsel. We must have eternal values. We've got, we've got to shake ourselves from what this world binds us with about the temporary. The temporary is more important than the eternal. No. No way. I need to cherish relationships that makes God's word a priority. Those are the people I need to be with. We must have an eternal perspective on everything in this life. Could you shout out everything? Everything. everything. I must have that eternal perspective. Not just now, this moment, and what I could obtain or what I can do, but God, what is this going to mean there? Laying up my treasures in heaven. Nothing can hurt. My treasure in heaven, nothing, no one. But the things here, when we have Jesus as our first love, I know it's seen in our relationship with other Christians. I love you, and you love me because he loves us. And that means investment of time, money, resources, talent, things, material goods just like Scripture teaches us. And then i got to look at my motivation. Why do I do what I do for the Lord? So I can get the pat on the back? Yo, pastor, good going, man, I loved it! And that's easy to do. Or, do I just want a tax deduction for my giving? And some people do that. Oh, I got a witness because they told me I should. And then the whole idea of accountability. It's a dirty word in church, I know. But still, still, some reason, we are not finding the person that God has for our lives. Wow. Someone that could watch me back. I need someone to watch my back. I need it. Well, the Lord is watching from above. No. No. You see, in the very essence of what I shared in that fake letter, no one knows me better than my wife. No one knows me better than my children. And no one knows me better than my inner circle that God has put into my life. I could shun that and just stay away? Or I could say, thank you, God, and give myself to it more and more and more. And then just the presence of God. How long has it been? I remember a song growing up as a kid, and my mom used to play this record by some girls group, girls quartet, and they used to sing, how long has it been since you talk with the Lord? And not, I mean, that's in my head. And today I say, yes, how long has it been since I've had a good long talk with the Lord, taking time to be in his presence? Because I need to be renewed daily, daily. Will we face these truths? Let me share with you just what I know I need to do. I need to go to bed thinking about God. And I need to wake up thinking about God. And if I'm not, something is wrong. That's exactly what it was like when I first fell in love with Evelyn. I went to bed thinking about her, and I woke up thinking about her. Crying, crying, I want to be with her. And the passion, as you know, can easily disappear. What's the only standard of love acceptable to God? Anything less than a pure, 
passionate love for Christ means we're being deceived. Look at that church. Look at that. That's where the title comes from in this message. Anything less than a pure love for a pure Christ that's passionate means that I am being duped somewhere along the line. And it also allows that thing or that person to be gradually breaking down my life until I'm at a place where I never dreamed I could be at. And it's not a good place. You remember what Samuel said? He said about David, I believe he said it to Jesse, David's father. You look at the outward, but God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. When we take our relationship for granted, life becomes so routine, it means that things are at an alert status. Danger, danger, danger. Because my love for Christ must be pure. Our love for Christ must be pure. And he accepts nothing less than that passionate love. And he's not impressed with the outward. Acts 13, 22. It reminds me again of the story. And that's why I kept going back to the play that I, I saw. It says that, but God removed Saul and replaced him with David. Why? Why? A man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And then look at that last sentence. He will do everything I want him to do. Why? Because you do that for someone you are passionately in love with. Oh, God. Can I just confess? Yesterday, I wasn't passionately in love with my wife. She said, honey, could you just clean the baseboard? I went, why are we going to clean the baseboard? <laughs> it was a lack of passionate love right there. <laughs> She's laughing. I got her good. If I'm reading Scripture right, right, if you go back to the original text, Christ will remove any congregation, any church, any church, if it's lost its true passion and purpose for God. So I need to remember the way I was in love with Jesus. Do you remember the day you fell in love with Jesus? If you don't, check it out. I need to remember what that love was about in my life and how much the fact of how I lost that passion for Christ. And then I need to repent. Scripture's clear. I need to turn away from the things that cause me to lose my passion for Christ. I need to adjust. I need to rearrange. I need to do whatever to align my life with Jesus because I'm so in love with him. And stop making excuses. All of us that say why, why we are not passionately in love with him because God knows. If I hear that again, I'm going to scream. God knows. God, Yeah, God knows. God knows you're not passionately in love with him. And I need to make that turnabout and then renew my life to that original fellowship that was broken by my sin and was broken by my neglect. Because if not, the church that loses its love will lose its light. And we cannot be a careless church. And I cannot be a careless individual. I can't get stuck on life the way I see right now. I can't get stuck on what other people are doing. I need to see and look at my own life and make sure that I'm loving Jesus with all my heart with all my soul, with all my mind, all my heart, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Right?
Let's pray.